Hey everybody, welcome to our webinar today with UNM Rainforest Innovations. Um, today we have Stacy Sacco with us and he's gonna be doing a presentation on creativity and how to use creativity for your small business. So I'll hand it over to you, Stacy. Okay, trying to see how many people are in the room. You said there was like 12 or 14 just to... There's seven right now. Okay. Um, some people might join later. Okay. So um, I always take a picture of all the names just so I can send you a note if you, or if you have a question, I can follow up. So I'm Stacy Sacco and uh, delighted to be here uh, on behalf of the New Mexico uh, or UNM Rainforest Innovations Group. Cecilia's my hero. She's always uh, booking me into these things and then also coordinating things. So I know she'll stay on. If anything gets crazy with the internet, as it happens, she'll help fix all that. So, uh, Just a little bit of background on me so you see where I'm coming from on a lot of this is um, I have uh, been working in some aspect of marketing for about 30 years. I don't know. It's a long time. Uh, everything from uh, a marketing manager at uh, the or VP marketing at the Albuquerque Chamber to a uh, national marketing manager for Hyundai. So I've been around a lot of creative people. I've seen a lot of things. And it's interesting because um, even when I was a kid, hold on one second. When I was a young man, my dad, one of my dad's friends, when I was about 18, gave me this book, Applied Imagination. I think it's out of print now, but oh my gosh, this thing changed my life. Because what it was about was looking at problems as opportunities as opposed to problems as uh, challenges or problems as negative things. So that changes your whole perspective. And uh, the last few years, I've been teaching entrepreneurial studies and Shark Tank class at UNM, Anderson School of Management. So that's opened up another aspect of how do you apply some of these creativity techniques to small business? And I, I know some other teachers at UNM offer not necessarily workshops, but a lecture or two within their semester on this. And I always add one lecture on uh, creativity. So here's that first page here, and I'm sure I'll, we'll have all this available to you guys to look at. I think I have 30 slides, so I'm going to pop through them pretty fast and then give a ch chance and opportunity, or you guys an opportunity for any of you to volunteer and say, hey, here's a challenge I have or a new thing I'm trying to do, and we can help you brainstorm some ideas as a group. So anyways, um, all my information's here uh, to just give you a little bit of background and then all my slides should be available to you. And I assume, will those be, will they just contact you to say? Cecilia, should I have them contact you for a copy of the slides? Uh, yeah, I can, I will post it on our website. Okay, great. So underneath all of this, there's about Oh, 10 different models that people use for doing, uh, coming up with uh, solutions to problems or coming up with new products or starting a business. The one thing that was funny to me though, is once you really start looking at this, is that a lot of people have solved their problems almost accidentally. There was a gentleman, I, one of my favorite stories is the story about Velcro. There was a Swiss electrical engineer who was in the Alps walking around and he'd get these little uh, burrs it would attach to his pants and his dog's fur. And it was like, how, how does that work? So he questioned it and turned that into Velcro. So it was sort of an accident in a way, but uh, I'm always about, well, wait a minute, I get the accident. I mean, I know 3M had invented the yellow stickies with that was that glue was an accident. There's so many stories. I'm all about making it more accessible and looking at specific types of techniques or models to get to an answer as opposed to, so you can repeat it, as opposed to being in an accident. So uh, probably, uh, again, I'm not going to cover, there's another whole set of these that, um, uh, that other people use. In fact, at the back of this book, he's got a, a bunch of things where ideas or questions he asks about, turn it upside down, whatever you have, and see if you can solve it backwards and 
things like that. So I'll talk about some of those, but these are more the traditional ones. So I'll go through each of these real fast and then share some other ideas. Underneath all of this, if you're an entrepreneur, I did go to Kaufman Institute and took the entrepreneurial mindset workshop for a couple of days. And basically they're teaching you about how to be an entrepreneur or think about the mindset of an entrepreneur. And that's really, in my mind, sort of the basis for creativity. It's about seeing problems as uh, opportunities to uh, solve problems and then uh, make money in the back end of all that. So uh, the, if you break out the six characteristics of the entrepreneurial mindset, I won't read these except that you're seeing, the first one is the most important one to me, is seeing and creating opportunities. So I laugh because uh, years ago, I went to a workshop. It was the Direct Marketing Association meeting in Chicago. And the guest speaker was a woman talking about how uh, she had read this sort of fictional story. And this was, I, I got to actually, I got a copy of her speech and then I copied in her uh, scripted, uh, her script into this. So, and I apologize, I don't have her name here. I should cite her, but um, I think she said it was anonymous. But basically what this story is about is getting you to think differently. It's about if aliens came here and looked at the earth, what would they see? Well, they might not see humans, but they might rather see metallic creatures called cars that are being taken care of by humans, these two-legged two -legged slaves. It's a fun story. I won't go into more detail on it, except to say that what she then said was, so if we take a look at each industry and from alien eyes, what would we see? So one of the things, since I was working as uh, vice president of marketing for Transamerica, we, we were talking about financial services and insurance. And she said, you know, looking at things differently outside the box, you might reinvent the whole financial services industry because who's buying more products than anybody is women and who has more needs when the, they get older because men uh, have shorter lifespans. So these women need more insurance and other products in their later years. So why aren't we selling to them? And at that time, everything was more about uh, sort of a man's view or male view of insurance and finance. So I thought that was great at the time because I've seen that play out in other products like Saturn. Uh, when I was at Hyundai, we had an issue with, we well did a survey of our customers and found out that most of the customers of Hyundai's were women. And so we started to hire some women sales reps and at our dealerships or encourage that. They're pretty independent, but Saturn did that. And so, you know, you're paying attention to what's the marketplace and then come back and get creative about how you solve that, uh, solve a challenge. Uh, the other one that I love to do in my classes at UNM is the first class, I'll have my students talk about some problem. So, okay, then we brainstorm solutions and try to come up with ideas for products or services that solve that problem, but where we can make money. So the, the whole exercise is called problems equal profits. So this one, the typical one the students complain about is parking. So, okay, how about, my favorite one was this first one, and one of the students was gonna do this actually. It's create a real-time app showing open parking spots. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not the one. Let's see, the open. Oh, it was the second one, I'm sorry. They're creating another app. Uh, the first one's great though, it's where are there open spots on, on the various bus routes, that would be great. But this other one was, I thought more clever, that you have all these homes around campus that have that people go to work and they have their driveway empty. Well, like sort of a Airbnb kind of a thing, why don't you rent out those driveways, any extra money that's made from that goes to the neighborhood watch or the neighborhood association the folk, everybody, it's a win, win, win. The, the local people have somebody parked in their driveway so it looks like somebody's home, so it deters crime, et cetera, et cetera. So one of my students is actually working on that one. But um, so they'd have a map of all the homes around Albuquerque that had, or the UNM that had agreed to participate and these folks could park their cars there. So I'm sure there's lots of problems about people being in their driveway when they get home et cetera, et cetera. But uh, what a great idea to take advantage of what's already there. So there's lots of ideas that the students came back with. One of my favorite ones was another example was that I had a friend 
who introduced me to it, somebody had moved here who didn't like Albuquerque. I'm like, what are you doing here? But he said he didn't like it. And his big complaint was that he had to go to Santa Fe. And his, uh, he would, uh, he complained about the, tra the train. Now my friends at the train don't like me to talk about this, but with the rail runner, but they, he said, you know, the rail runner is so slow. It was supposed to be an express train or bullet train that he can go back and forth to Santa Fe in his car before the train gets there. Well, there's some positive things about being on the train. Um, in particular, you can work that whole time instead of having to drive and pay attention to the uh, street or the highway. But I had heard a story, and that's what I tell my students, is there's a story about a couple that met on the train, fell in love, he asked her to marry him, and then they got married on the train, had their reception on the train. They re bought one of the, rented one of the cars and repurposed it. So I said to my students, okay, let's repurpose the train and turn it into something. It's a slow train. I'll go with that. I don't think it's slow, but let's assume that. So they came up with some crazy ideas like a um, co-working space on one of the cars. Another one was defined fitness on one of the cars. So you could work out all the way up to the uh, to Santa Fe and back. And uh, then there was, uh, what was another one? High Wi-Fi. So I have one of the cars where it's a, a kitchen car or cafe car where you can, like a lot of trains, where you can buy food and on and on and on. So we came up with all these crazy ideas, but they they had to prove to me that they were profitable. So what would your cost be? And then play all that out. And every one of them were going to make money on this. So not such a bad idea. My favorite one of the parking congestion was a concierge service. So when I could drive up to campus and I just can't see my hand, but just hand off my keys <laughs> or a personal, um, is that one in here? Let's see. Oh, I, we, I was teasing with how about a personal uh, drone so I can just get in my drone, take it to school and then drop me off and then drone go home. And I ended up one of my students sent me, there are now drones that can carry one individual. So and they have the jet pack, so. Lots of interesting opportunities there. So underneath all of this is you're trying to create value. One of my professors at Pepperdine University, when I got my MBA, talked about value as marginal utility divided by price, meaning what's the value of the, the product is what does it do for you? What's its marginal utility? So you have to be careful of that. Are, what you're providing, does it have, are you paying attention to your customers? So I, since I teach sales, I would tell you, you should be listening more than talking. Hard for me, but you should do that. And then understand what the needs are. So this, the reason I wanted to show you this one was because it starts with the problem. Almost every problem, if you're going to do it in business, you need to go talk to your customers and find out what your customers' needs are. It starts with them. So just to back up a little bit about one of the creativity exercises I do in my class that sort of sets, again, sort of the pattern of what you're going to be thinking about is all, there's this game you can play. It's called uh, the nine dots. I've heard other names of it, but using a pen or pencil, connect the dots with only four lines. Start at one, oops, I'm showing you the solution, sorry. Start at one dot and connect all the dots without lifting your pen or pencil from the paper. You may cross a dot more than once. Good luck. If you ever have a class or workshop that you're running or a team uh, meeting with your staff and you want to get people thinking and have, having this discussion about getting outside the box, the problem is we have a lot of ideas, but they tend to be just the same old idea with a little bit of an adjustment or evolution, not a revolution. And sometimes I think you need to get outside the box to get, because it looks like a square box when you see this. So this is the solution. And what you have to do is, you know, go outside what looks like a perceived box. So that's a different mindset. It's thinking outside the box. Interesting enough, I love, interesting enough, I love this model. So I have researched it over the years and found that a lot of uh, schools use this for younger kids to get them thinking creatively. And uh, here's some of those solutions the kids came up with. One was uh, fold the paper so you're moving the dots and then line them up so you can have one line. It actually breaks the rules because you're supposed to have four lines, but that's okay. Uh, second one is you uh, create a conal shape and put the dots together. And then my favorite one is if you want to think way outside the box, it's go outside the earth and you think about how do we uh, connect all these dots? Again, one line, not four, but 
still, it's interesting to think outside of that, what looks like a perceived square. And then this fun, one of the funniest ones was this young girl in 1974 wrote to her dad or wrote to her professor, dear professor James, my dad and I were doing puzzles from conceptual blockbusting. It's a book. We were mostly working on the dot ones like the nine dots. My dad said a man found a way to do it with one line. I tried it and did it. It not with folding, but I used a fat line. It doesn't say you, uh, you can't use a fat line like this. Uh, actually, you need a very fat, my favorite part of this, she's 10. You actually, you need a very fat writing apparatus. Uh, excuse the typos, but I know someday I'm going to meet her somewhere. How old would she be now? 40 plus 10, she's 50. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so the, one of the first techniques is brainstorming. And if you've never done this, the real situation, a real challenge is that you come up with a problem, you throw it out to a group of people and you say, let's brainstorm some ideas. So what you wanna do in the traditional methodology is put the question or idea or problem up on a board and then just anybody's ideas, just throw them up there, just write them down and don't judge them. We have a tendency to judge things. I know um, most of the uh, times I've seen with students is they, they depending on their age, but a lot of times they'll come with uh, very little sort of adulting thinking about things. Because the problem with a lot of marketing is you'll want to put, you'll want to start judging it and say, well, what's it going to cost? How are we going to produce this thing? I know my... Um, one of my dear friends from uh, Tucson when I was at University of Arizona, he had named Virginia Slim cigarettes and uh, tab, drink, all kinds of things. So when we get together, we would talk about crazy ideas and solving problems. And one day he said, we were teasing, we were at a, a dinner party at the house and he had a 15 year old son, he didn't want to start driving yet. So he's like, how do I keep this kid not driving the car? So uh, of course, it's just being a good parent, I guess. But I said, uh, we were teasing. I said, well, how about just getting crazy? I, a prescription windshield for your car so only you can drive that car. Uh, then this young man came, was listening in, and he said, well, wait a minute. He had some really cool binoculars that adjusted to your eyes. So then he thought, well, I'll just replace your windshields with uh a windshield that is uh, just to your eyes, to anybody's eyes. So that's crazy. It'd be really complicated if you had uh, bifocals because you'd be driving on the street like this. But I understand what it was is that as adults, we were thinking about it very pragmatically. Okay, a, a windshield that has this particular thing. And then, of course, John, my friend, said, well, the problem is how do we have these in all the different cars? It's going to get expensive. He's thinking about it production-wise. In the practical side of it but the young man his his son was thinking about it variably so that it didn't matter that it was that one product but that how can i adjust it so it's adjustable to everything or variable i thought that was very interesting so he wasn't judging he was doing what would i call pure brainstorming so that's pretty typical what you have to be careful of is that people do get into discouraging words i love to show this slide in my classes um because there's people over the years who, uh, after somebody had invented something, people would say, well, it didn't, wouldn't work. So a couple of the fun ones in here are, this is Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM in 1943. Quote, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Wow, okay. Um, so it's another one is, uh, And one of the teachers uh, for Fred Smith, I think it was at Yale, yeah, Yale University, his uh, paper that he did for a class was he, inv he had a, did a idea for a new business called FedEx. And his teacher didn't like it. He thought it was impractical, this hub, hub and spoke concept. So he gave him a C on the paper. And I'm always like, Ugh, if only he'd known, right? And then where's another one here? Oh, one last one. So we went, this is Steve Jobs. So we went to Atari and said, hey, we've got this amazing thing, even built it with some of your parts. Uh, let's see if I can move my screen here. And what do you think about funding us? Or we'll give it to you. We just want to do it. Pay our salary. We'll come work for you. And they said, no. So they went to who? So then we went to Hewlett Packard and they said, hey, we don't need you. You haven't gone to college. You have 
haven't gone to college yet. Apple computer founder Steve Jobs said in his attempts to get Atari and Hewlett Packard interested in his and Steve Wozniak's personal computer. So I'm always about encouraging people to come up with crazy out of the box ideas and then get them on a list and then go back and judge them, but not the first round. So I teach a sales class and I always talk about no judging. And when somebody says something negative, because there's all the standard stuff, it won't work. It's going to cost too much. We tried it before. So here's some responses to those. Um, what's a good one here? It won't work. How will we know unless we try it? Okay. So always be on the positive side of hearing uh, these ideas and try to think it through. Second idea is this idea of six hat thinking. And Edward de Bono wrote this book. And what I think he was really, as I read that, I thought, you know, what he's really trying to get to is that you can be incredibly positive, but you do need to have, be smart about it too. And that there may be something going on in your situation or idea that you've presented that could be dangerous. For example, uh, one of the ideas I have my students work on is a chip that you put in the side of your brain. I think uh, Elon Musk is working on that now. So instead of reading a book, the book just goes in like Matrix, where uh, what was her name? Trinity had to learn how to ride a helicopter. So the, the negative on that, there's a negative you need to think through is that what if there's a virus in that chip or if somebody wants to control everybody's brains on the planet? So we talk about that. So you want to be positive. So what, I don't think Edward DeMarne was thinking of those ideas, but I know he was thinking about six thinking hats. So I bought these years ago. I actually have a color baseball cap, a black one. I've got a white one, red one, yellow. And so how this would work as a technique is that you draw out an idea to a group and then say, if you have an idea uh, or response, pick one of the hats and tell us what you think. So this gives you an opportunity to say something negative in the black. Black reminds us of a judge's robes. What risks are you concerned about? You need to absolutely have that sort of thinking in part of your uh, creativity process. It's not all just glorious. It's going to always be great. I mean, that's what the yellow is for. Yellow suggests sunshine and optimism, what are its benefits? So you have uh, an opportunity to create a creative uh, team building exercise by getting some of these hats or even just showing the colors and telling people to comment based on uh, the what each of those colors connotes or the topic that it, it represents. So another one is called forced analogy. And this is used a lot actually in business where you'll see something that works somewhere else and then you adapt that solution to your situation if, if you can make this tie or ma make an analogy between them. So I had heard of that technique at a uh, meeting years ago and then i was at another meeting in la when i was uh, living in orange county and i was talking to the chief of police about the riots and he said well how do we fix that and i said well as humans we have a we have the human body as a system and we now have holistic thinking about how we heal our bodies and he kind of looked at me like you're crazy and then i said but what what's so my question is what's the temperature of la how can we use what we're doing over there to uh, fix the problems in the city. So some of that's realizing that it's a system. We have dependent organizations taking preventative actions, creating links to each of the different communities and paying attention to their specific needs. That's not unlike what you do over here on the left side. So you just transfer those, tech, tech, those ideas over to the other. Another version of that is called morphological force connections. Now this is a little different. But basically, you take your product and create a table of all the attributes. So the one example I use in my classes was a car or an automobile. And I'll say, it could be a truck, but it's a mode of transportation. So there's four categories of ways we can attributes of that product, an automobile or that device. So there's the shape, the wheels, how many wheels, fuel that's used to run it, and materials. So what this is, is a factorial. So it's four uh, things taken, uh, it's four times three times two times one. So it's possible combinations is 24 possible combinations. So you put them all out. Square, four, gas, metal, what is that? Square, four, electricity, metal. 
and you try out all the possible combinations, then you come back and say, is there a market for each of these? So I, to play this game a little bit with my students to get them thinking this way, I always get one joker in my class who goes, oh, I got it. Square four uh, gas and metal. It's called a Volvo. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> They're so funny. They love to tease me. So uh, this is another way to do create creative modeling, but it's uh, sort of forcing it. But it's looking at what, where's, <coughs> what attributes could make a potential market. You know, of course, out of the 24, probably 12 are going to be, have no market or they're too hard to build. So that's that second stage. We start judging. It. But what I have my students do is I have them build a new taco. So they have to pick one or two or create other things they could use. But um, basically what they're looking at is, you know, what's the components of a taco and then build a new taco. And then they have to tell me who's, what's the product name, who's the target market. Quite honestly, the ones that win, then whoever comes up with the coolest idea, we vote as a class. And then they get uh, Taco Bell cards or re restaurant gift cards for the winners. Um, what's most interesting about that is the ones that seem to do the best start with the customer in mind. So if you have a top, your market is athletes, and the Lobos, you probably want to have a very healthy taco. So what's a healthy taco? Well, it's probably not fried. Uh, it's probably not breaded. It's probably actually boiled. I should put that in there. Uh, you use more protein and, and some healthy garnishments like a lot of vegetables. So there's a lot of ways to approach this, but it starts with your customer in mind. And then second, okay, you want to sell it to students that are in a big hurry to get to their classes. Well, you probably want something that's easy to make. It's probably a wrap. So it's just interesting to use this as another way to get to a solution and to create new products, new ideas, take apart your product into its different component parts. It's called morphological force connections. The other idea that you can use is backward planning. And it's funny, I happened to be at an AED luncheon years ago and who was here speaking was Elon Musk. And so I talked to him afterwards just for a minute, shook his hand and uh, I was the guy who, Gary Tonjes had told me, he, somebody needs to tell him his plane's going to be late. He hadn't checked yet. So I talked to Elon Musk. I said, your plane's late, I guess. He goes, oh, my goodness. So I sat with him for an extra couple of minutes having a cup of coffee at the table. And I loved his presentation. I kept saying, how did you come up with this, these ideas? He said, well, I do a lot of things. I do backward planning. So what he had was he was talking about if we get to a situation where we try to get off oil in the world, What's the one renewable energy? Well, it's the sun. So he's saying, well, we should have solar as the uh, foundation for all of the energy we use. Then you have to think it through. He said, but because if we go to biofuel as a solution, uh, he said, the best thing to make it a biofuel is corn. And he said, so if we do that, we're going to have to grow more corn than we have probably space for on the planet. And by the way, you better not like cornflakes. <laughs> He was funny, but he said, it's all about starting with the end in mind and then working backwards and figuring out where's this possible? What's the best solution? So he said, uh, when I told him about his plane, he says, well, there's an example. If I have to get to my, uh, my flight, it's at 730. Well, okay. When do I need to check in at the counter? So when do I need to arrive at the airport to get on the shuttle bus and then work it backwards, parking, long-term parking, leave the house, wake up, shower, uh, 24 hours ahead, get your seating assignment. So it's always start with the end in mind and then work your way backwards. Another creativity technique. Um, I had to laugh because he said, so he told me about the plane flight and he says, so for example, another example is if you want to go to Mars and I'm like, what are you even talking about Mars? And so of course that's more, I didn't hear it first, I'm sure, but I just had to laugh. He's talking about Mars, you know, you need to build the rockets, etc. I mean, he's, he's a pretty intelligent guy, and pretty amazing to hang out with for those few minutes I had, but um, great way to put, sort of put in your head, start with the end in mind and then work backwards. The rocks in your life, I'm just gonna leave this here. I'm not gonna read it so much as just to say, this is a great example of what's important to get to, it's more time management, but it's again about creating solutions. So what uh, this one, uh, this classic story is about is that uh, you need to fill up a bucket and you've got stuff to put in there, rock and sand. So 
if you put in the sands for sand first, you can't put the rocks in so easily. So you start with the big things, the rocks, the priority items first, add the sand. And then at the end of that story, the, uh, I guess the professor said, well, we done? And the students said, yeah. And they said, well, wait a minute, we can still put something else in here and they poured in water. So interesting. It's about though thinking about what's important first and then work your way backwards. So one of the ones, the most common things I've seen with uh, businesses, and I did a lot of this. I was the, one of the regional managers at West for a couple of years. And then I was the vice president of the Chamber of Commerce here at the Albuquerque Chamber. And I would help people. And this came out years ago, but I see a lot of folks from SCORE use this technique. And they just say, let's look at uh, something from, and they use the acronym SCAMPER. So if we could substitute a different product for that same solution or problem, different solution for the same problem, what would that look like? Uh, if we combined some things, adapted it, mo modified it or magnified it, made it bigger, put to another use, eliminate, uh, re reverse, rearrange. So this is a great way to sort of get your mind flowing. And I would tell you, this is probably the most common one I've seen when I've worked with small businesses myself and then seen now, I see, uh, what's his name? Uh, well, there's several people, Dar and Vic and some others over at SCORE, excellent group to talk with about your small business. But they, the ones I talk to usually use Scamper as a way to start getting people to kind of loosen up on their ideas and look for solutions to things. Uh, five, five whys, this is more, I can't imagine where this came from. I, well, I can't imagine, it's probably kids. Because kids love to do that, right? I don't have any children, but they'll ask, well, why do you do that, daddy or mommy? And well, well this, and they go, well, why, why, why? And finally, I think the parents just always yell out, well, just because. But it's a technique for continuous improvement of company. You know, ask five whys in a row and you're fixing the cause, not the problem. So you're working your way backwards. Here's a great example. Problem statement, the vehicle will not start. Well, why? The battery's dead. Well, why? The alternator is not functioning. Why? And you work your way down to the vehicle was not maintained according to the recommended service schedule. So it's another sort of dialogue you can use to get down to a solution to a problem. Here's another one. Um, our client is refusing to pay for leaflets we printed for him. Well, why? The delivery was late, so the leaflets couldn't be used. What you get down to is that they didn't print the, uh, whatever it is, or what are they selling here? Leaflets. So what they need to do to solve that problem is find an ink supplier who can deliver at short notice so that we can continue to minimize inventory, reduce waste, and response, respond to customer demands. So there's, there's some real value in asking why and then working your way down, self down that list. Uh, why, 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 why? And the five whys is it. What I'm always looking for in all this stuff is trying to find a win-win. I was telling Cecilia earlier, I know I have some friends who will refuse to wear masks and the whole thing's a hoax. And then I have other friends who, uh, and I'm a mask wearer, so I don't have one on today, but I love wearing masks, I not love wearing masks, but I will wear a mask because I think it's important as part of my duty to others because I don't think it's a hoax. But so I was at uh, a restaurant here recently and I said, hey, why don't we solve that problem? Because he said they were having to, now of course I think the governor's changed the rules, but. I said, why don't we have a mask and a no mask section? And so that you can split it up. You want to wear a mask? Fine. You don't want to wear a mask? Go over there. Uh, they, I know in years ago in the bars, they used to have smoking and non-smoking sections. And I heard at one point in Japan, when they first came up with iPhones, people were on their iPhones talking so much. It was a tennis court that broke it up. So it's iPhone or no iPhone tennis court. So why don't we figure out solutions to things instead of looking at each other and screaming and yelling? I'm looking for win-wins. How can we get together? So some fun ideas just to talk about some things I've seen or got, gotten involved in. If you go up to Santa Fe, there's, in fact, at uh, one of the restaurants, I listed them here. Oh yeah, Standard Diners. They've taken an old cigarette machine and they've put in it little boxes that look like cigarette packets and they sell art in there. I just think that's a marvelous solution to or idea for how to improve on that. So get people, get fewer people smoking. I don't know if you can see that, but there's, it's called an art. Man. So there's like art. Every time I see that, I buy like three or four of them. 
Another one was when I was at Transamerica, we had an issue with, um, there's a little more to that story, but we had an issue with, we weren't meeting our customers' needs. So I mentioned to the president of my division uh, that we should wear our customers' hats. I just seen Tom Peters at a, the guy who wrote In Search of Excellence at a conference saying, you know, you need to pay attention to your customers walk in their shoes. So I made up a cap that said customer on it. This isn't it because it got to be such a great idea. That cap I had is gone. I have no idea where it is, but the president of our division rented out, got, asked me to buy 800 caps for all of our employees. We rented out a movie theater and we gave everybody a cap and had this story about how we need to care about our customers. They sign our checks. So I took the same idea to Hyundai when I was director of marketing there for their captive finance company. They loved it so much. They had me make caps. What was interesting the symbol for Hyundai in, or in uh, Korean for word for customer, that's the symbol. You can see that, turn it. And what it means is guest. Interesting. So then when I was at Vice President of Kirtland Federal Credit Union, I would do training for all of our frontline staff and I'd give everybody member caps. You'd have to think through the ideas as if you were the member. What would you say? And I've done that in many, many other sales training or customer training services. Another company I worked for, the manager, when we brainstorm ideas, I didn't like the idea. It was cute at first. And I thought, oh, he would, if you had a, a bad idea or you were talking too much, he'd throw this Elmo at you. So, and then what that meant was enough, let's move on. And so in the beginning, it was funny, but some people were throwing it at people. I got to throw it at me, of course, but some people took offense to that. So I thought, eh, you want to try to keep it positive. So another fellow I worked with had, if you didn't, if you didn't like somebody's idea, you could throw a skunk at them and then they'd catch it and you'd it'd be that your idea smells bad. I ran a bunch of those. I changed it to, if it was a good idea and I would throw around honeybees. So I got a bunch of these. Um, there's other things you can do to get people uh, start thinking creatively. There's a thing from Van Uch wrote in innovative, if you can see this innovative whack pack. So it's, it's an accompaniment to his book, 60 creative strategies to provoke and inspire your thinking. So there's that. There's also table topics from Toastmasters. If you've ever been there, you, they'll give you a topic and you have to and respond to that question or issue or topic and talk about it for a minute to minute to two minutes. But they have some conversation cards you can buy to start a conversation and ask questions. Uh, I worked for a company uh, years ago that wanted to get everybody thinking creatively. So they gave us all clown noses just to be funny and get you sort of loosening up. And then another guy who, I don't think you can see me, had bought antenna and given us all that. So we would be, and big ears, that was another one. I've lost those, but it was about listening in on what your customer's needs are. Uh, up with people. I traveled with up with people right out of high school. I was a dancer performer for two years on the road. And then I uh, became the cast rep for my first cast of 163 alumni. And then when I was in LA, I started the up with people alumni association. I'm still on their board for the international group for the 20,000 alumni. But I just wanted to say, here are some crazy ideas that I used. I wanted to survey. We had six, um, 143 alumni in California. We have about 200 in, in New Mexico. So I wrote, sent Dom, me, I sent everybody this long survey. It was like three pages and said, what do you want to do? Do you want to have activities? Do you want to get involved? What kind of role would you like to take? This was pre-internet. Well, I got about, what was it? 27 responses. I was pretty upset because I put postage on 643 letters. And then I was sitting there one day. I thought, well, wait a minute. All these crazy people and up with people are performers. They're very extrovert. My ex, my wife, when we go to alumni reunions, calls it an extrovert fest. So back then I sent them all this postcard and it had three questions on it and said, call my phone and put your answers on my phone. Now, of course, pretty quickly, I figured out there was a couple of problems with that. One is that my tape recorded message didn't have uh, Comcast back then or any of that. So... I had to keep buying a bigger tape machine from uh, uh, Radio Shack, but 
and then the other problem is you got to train. These are now trans. You have to create transcripts, so you're going to have to listen to everything and type it in. But that's okay. The difference was is by sending them a postcard and saying, "Read the three questions in, and answer them." So there were questions like, you know, confirm your name and address. Uh, what activities would you like to participate in, and how would you like, or would you like to see us offer? And then what would you like to, what role would you like to take in that? That's pretty much it. Call between these hours, on and on. Here's the phone number. And um, I that changed from over from 27 responses to over 200. So that's probably in a way paying attention to your customer, which is that your customers, they're extroverts. Well, that's how they want to answer a survey. The other one that was interesting is I started a newsletter for my cast, which I did for 25 years, but I'd write to everybody and say, write me and tell me what you're doing. Well, I had one guy, <laughs> where is that? Dave Schmoltz, I will always remember, sent me a seven page letter and I'm like, Dave, dude. Yeah, there it is, oh my God. What I really wanted was just a paragraph or two. So the next year got smart, again, responding to my customers, I sent every one of the alumni a square, half a page, and said, fill it out with whatever you want. And then I took those squares and just glued them in to a, uh, onto this paper or taped them on and then just copied it. And this is the new newsletter. That, and so it's interesting because we have about 25 other ch ch uh, ch club or cast reps that now do this because it's so much easier. So... Again, just a clever idea on how to get outside the box. And then the only other thing is when I they asked me to start teaching at UNM, I thought, I'm not a teacher. I'm a marketing guy. So I called the, another idea here is call people that have been doing and doing it better than you. So I made a list of my top 10 teachers, Sydney Humble from El Dorado High School, Nick Mamana from University of Arizona. I remember them all. I called them all. Two had already passed, but eight of them were willing to spend a bunch of time with me on the phone talking about make your classes interactive. So I've always been nominated for 18 years of teaching at UNM for faculty of the year. I haven't won. I'm Susan Lucci. But I always laugh because people say, well, you're a great teacher, blah, blah, blah. And I go, no, I'm just channeling eight of my top 10 teachers. So it's not such a bad thing to pay attention to who's doing it right. I'm going to come back to this one. I just want to let you know what's also on these slides. When I was vice president of the chamber, one of the things that came out was, and I will always tell you, run your numbers. Run your numbers and see what's going on if you can. So I ran the numbers. We had these number of members, 43 through 18, uh, 1,800 members. But I thought, well, let's split them up by strata or number of employees. And then how many people or businesses are in those strata or those sectors, sections, and then it showed up really quickly that we had a bipolar thing going on. Our smallest, uh, down at the bottom here, our smallest companies, or small, the majority of our members were small, and that we were penetrating that market because I ran the numbers. But we also had a high percentage of people at the, high, at the bigger number, and I thought, well, what's going on here? So what I did was use that to create some new sales things a methodology or sales processes. So for the startups or the small businesses, we we had the salespeople were out making calls all week long and then they'd come in the last day of the week and do an activity report, which I thought was nonsense. I need them outside making calls. So, and instead of uh, spending a bunch of time pre-qualifying customers, I, I had a secretary and I had her switch her role to making initial calls for the sales reps set up the appointments, manage our customer relationship management software, and then follow up with collateral. I replaced the activity reports with results reports. So they, all they had to do is call me at the end of the week on Friday on their way home and tell me what sales or contracts did they get. And I'd put them in a spreadsheet and we're done. I don't want you coming in Friday, filling out an activity report of the third step in the fifth step program. Oh my God. Uh, launched a sales training program, with, which one of our sales reps was by far above everybody else. So I had her teach us what she did. And we came up with some really great scripts that she was using. Uh, overall, our sales jumped 20% uh, because of some of these efforts. The other one is the other end of that chart was the larger customers. So we created a campaign where the sales reps would work with, or I'd work with mostly the board members of the chamber who knew the presidents of main, main major companies and they would go with us on the sales calls. So a lot of companies would say, who's coming? Oh, the president of Loveless. 
is coming on our sales call. Oh, they want to take that sales call. They want to meet the president. And then any of the board members who sold anything or helped us sell, we would give them potentially, um, yeah, most sales, whoever got the most sales won a weekend trip to Napa and anybody sort of second, third, fourth place got a case of wine. Um, this was before total wine. I could have cut my costs on that. So just a little bit of an ad. I do uh, report in still the UNM rainforest and I'm doing uh, them the uh, interim director for the UNM Small Business Institute. If you need any help with any of that, like you'd like a student team to help you do a marketing plan or do some creative work, uh, go to the UNM Small Business Institute website and sign up. We have student teams, instead of doing a Harvard case study, will work for you for a semester. And uh, it's a fun experiential learning opportunity for them. Generally, everybody that has done this loves it. Uh, we've won some national awards for the reports they've done. And um, so there's that. I do know that CNM now offers a CNM digital media lab that's similar to this where the students will do a website for you. Uh, we've got a finance group at UNM Anderson that's wanting to do no financial analysis. Uh, there's another fabulous program. Cecilia is running this. It's UNM Rainforest has a certificate program. So any of these workshops that we, uh, she offers, she will put them online. You can go to this website and see all these videos. If you take seven of them and then answer the questions, there's 10 questions on each one, um, then you can get a UNM Rain Rain Rainforest Innovation Certificate. The certificate's great, but what's really great is if you look at the topics, these are fabulous uh, presentations. I did a couple, but you've got Susan Cornelius, who's probably started 20 something businesses. I know it's even bigger than that. You've got uh, some folks that have really done the work of starting a business and growing it. So they've, they're giving you their tips and techniques. So I would go to these based on the topic and what your needs are. And uh, so I have two pages of all the different topics you can uh, choose from. And then here's some uh, more information. There's some other groups here in town that are uh, great for being creative. Of course, I'd love Meow Wolf, and now there's the Electric Playhouse down here, Explorer Children's Museum, just a great, great new ideas. But uh, there's other groups. There's Creative Mornings, Santa Fe, there used to be a Creative Mornings, Albuquerque, where they have guest speakers who are doing creative, cool things. You've got a couple maker spaces in town, the Fuse, CNMU Fuse Makerspace, Q Labs. Uh, I think there's lots of great ideas that comes out of Groups like Santa Fe Innovates up in uh, Santa Fe, of course, John Mertz, I think is who runs that. He's the founder. Santa Fe Institute, they have Colloquia. You can go to some of those workshops. UNM has a lifelong learning through UNM Continuing Ed and on and on and on. So I think that's all my slides. No, there's some books and videos that I suggest you look at and some, yeah. So let me go back and we'll just take a minute does anybody want to open up their screen and just tell us a this one? What's your biggest challenge you face right now? And then people can maybe uh, unmute themselves and throw out some ideas. Let's get 10 ideas for you. 